Voices from Chernobyl, from the book by Svetlana Alexievich, adapted by Spencer Smith. On April 26, 1986, the worst nuclear accident in history occurred in Chernobyl, Ukraine, only 40 miles north of Kiev, the capital and a city of three million people. The Chernobyl disaster contaminated as much as three quarters of Europe. We may never know how many people died prematurely or how many children have been born deformed as a result of this tragedy. Only now is a leukemia epidemic being reported in New York City among Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian emigres, people who left their homeland after Chernobyl. Leukemia is a cancer that takes about 20 years to develop. Fortunately for the population of Kiev, but unfortunately for the people of Belarus, the wind that day blew mostly to the north. Over 485 villages had to be abandoned forever. Even today, approximately 2.1 million people, including 700,000 children, live on contaminated land. The voices you will hear are of people who lived through the disaster. The journalists who conducted these interviews and shaped their words into a book has herself died of cancer, as have some of those who you are about to hear. Ludmilla Ignatenko, wife of fireman Vasily Ignatenko. We were newlyweds. We still walked around holding hands, even if we were going to the store. I used to say to him, I love you. But I didn't know then how much. I had no idea. We lived in Pripyat, in the dormitory of the fire station where he worked, on the second floor. There were three other young couples, and we all shared a kitchen. On the first floor, they kept the trucks, the red fire trucks. One night, I heard a noise. It was late, after midnight. I looked out the window. He saw me. Close the window and go back to sleep. There's a fire at the reactor. I'll be back soon. I didn't see the explosion itself, just the flame. Everything was bright, the whole sky, a tall flame and smoke. And the heat was awful, even there at the firehouse. The smoke was from the burning bitumen that covered the roof. Later, he said it was like walking on tar. They tried to beat down the flames, kicked at the burning graphite with their feet. They weren't wearing protective clothing. No one told them they'd been called out for a fire. That was it. Hours went by, four o'clock, five, six. At six, we were supposed to go to his parents' house 25 miles away to help plant potatoes. Seven o'clock. At seven, they told me he was in the hospital. I ran there, but the police weren't letting anyone in. Other wives of husbands who'd gone to put out the fire were there too, but none of us could get in, only ambulances. The police shouted, the ambulances are radioactive. Stay back. Finally, I saw a friend who was a doctor at the hospital. Get me inside, I begged her. I can't. He's bad. They all are. I held on to her. I wouldn't let her go. Just to see him? All right, she said, but just 15 or 20 minutes. He was all swollen, puffed up. You could barely see his eyes. He needs milk, lots of milk, my friend the doctor said. They should drink at least three liters a day. But he hates milk. Well, he'll drink it now. And we didn't know it then, but a lot of the doctors and nurses in that hospital, especially the orderlies, 
would get sick themselves and die. At 10 in the morning, the cameraman, Shishinok, died. He was the first. I said to my husband, Vasya, what should I do? Get out of here. Go, leave, save our baby. But first, I need to bring you milk. Then we'll decide what to do. My friend Tanya comes running in. Her husband's in the same room. We go in her father's car to town. We buy all the milk we can find, and we come back. But they all started throwing up as soon as they drank it. They passed out. They got put on IVs. The doctors told them that they'd been poisoned by gas. Nobody said anything about radiation. Only the military people wore surgical masks. They were all over town. They closed off the roads, washed the streets with some white powder. That night, they wouldn't let any of us into the hospital. There was a sea of people. Vasya came to the window and yelled something. I couldn't hear what he said, but someone did. They were being taken to Moscow. All of us wives got together and decided we'd go with them. We punched, we clawed at the soldiers. Now it was the army all around, not the police. A doctor came out and said, they're being flown to Moscow, but we need to bring clothes. The clothes they wore at the reactor had been burned. When we came running back with the clothes, the plane was already gone. They tricked us, 